Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Thank you. Okay, well, if it's okay with everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, really excited to be here today with you guys. My name is Dr. Nakano. I'm a hematologist out of Children's Colorado, uh, where I also am the medical director of our Vascular Anomaly Center. Uh, thrilled for the invitation to join you guys today and uh, honored to be part of this series uh, on uh, lymphatic anomalies. Uh, it was a great presentation. I, I saw uh, the last one by Dr. Adams and, and uh, big, big shoes to, to fill to, to follow that act. Uh, but happy to give it our best shot over here. I'm, I'm looking at this first slide that, that I'm, I'm saying, who is that, who is that pre-COVID young gentleman that has so much excitement in his eyes? I feel like I need a, a post-COVID headshot and that's kind of more weary with more, more gray in my hair, you know? Uh, there are a number of sponsors we'd like to thank. And of course there is a, uh, a disclaimer uh, uh, stating that, uh, you know, trust your own medical professional uh, with your own health care, uh, unless, uh, of course, I am your doctor, in which case I'll see you in the clinic. And for myself, uh, although I do some academic consulting for Novartis, uh, none of the issues uh, will be discussed in today's presentation. Okay, so in general, what I wanted to go over today was a few objectives. Uh, you know, one is very common and a theme throughout all of these uh, conversations, increased awareness and education on these dynamic complex lymphatic anomalies. Uh, number two, and probably if there's a theme throughout the conversation is to discuss kind of the high risk uh, morbidity of lymphatic leaks and bony involvement in these conditions. And really, I, I want to convey that aspect of it, that these, the words I'm using are, are very intentional, uh, you know, because this was a field that used to believe that these lesions were very static, they didn't change, but they're dynamic, they do. And I think it's quite underrecognized, not just the morbidity, but I could have used mortality as far as how uh, severe these conditions are and unrecognizing how life-threatening some of the complications can be. Uh, so it's very important that I think we stress uh, that nature as we go about discussing uh, rare diseases. Uh, and, and number three there is really, how do we create that dialogue amongst ourselves? This is the community uh, to take what is a communal interest from all of us and move it forward. You know, how do we move it forward with uh, good natural history studies of these conditions, good uh, communal databases uh, and venture into the world of, of interventional trials that is coming up at, you know, very soon. So just a plug that uh, like Dr. Adams, uh, most of us in the field uh, subscribe to the uh, International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies as a community that has provided us nomenclature for these conditions. Uh, within the general category, we will be discussing lymphatic malformation. Uh, within the subcategory, the primary topics will be the complex lymphatic uh, malformations. Um, uh, and, and so just to plug that if anyone is unfamiliar with that site, you can go visit ISFA uh, online. Uh, it's a great, for the provider community, I think it's a great uh, group to be a membership of. Uh, they share the same uh, beliefs and advocacy that, that all of us do here. So, you know, the first thing I wanted to do is kind of what everyone needs to do uh, when they start these conversations, make sure everyone in the audience has a good grasp of what the lymphatic system is. Uh, and although this is kind of an obligatory slide, you know, to talk about the lymphatic system as this kind of parallel uh, uh, a plumbing system next to the venous system that collects excess fluid uh, from the soft tissues, you know, this was something kind of early on that we wanted to make sure that we could convey to families in a way uh, that was very family pediatric friendly, uh, but, and, you know, got the basic concept down. And so if you humor me, you know, I'd like to take you through an effort that we went through uh, to produce uh, a video, uh, two videos, actually, one for lymphatics and one for lymphatic malformations uh, that would help us in the clinic. Uh, and I know it's a few minutes of your time, but ideally it, it's, it's fun and it's productive. Uh, I'd give a shout out to uh, Nathan Billington here at the Children's Hospital Colorado, who's a digital animator. 
it's amazing. We hired a digital animator. How could you not take advantage of that? Uh, and we spent a, a little bit of time together. Uh, and you know, he was able to pick my brain and turn something that is a a standard monologue that I give families on the lymphatic system and 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 turn it into the the animation of kind of my dreams, you know, in that in that respect. And so sit back, relax. Uh, if you have popcorn, it's a good time. Bust that out. Welcome to part one of our series on the lymphatic system by the Vascular Anomaly Center here at Children's Hospital Colorado. In this video, we'll explain what the lymphatic system is and click here or check the description below for part two, where we explore what happens when it doesn't form correctly. The lymphatic system is an efficient, intricate, and vital organ system in your body, but it is often poorly understood. Our bodies have two main circulatory systems for transporting fluid, cells, nutrients, and waste, the cardiovascular or blood system and the lymphatic system. They are like two mass transit systems with passengers, routes, and destinations. Both are made up of vessels, the train tracks and roadways, and passengers, the cells, molecules, and fluid. These systems transport passengers from all over the body. The blood system is like a high-speed train, the non-stop express. It carries cells like red blood cells, platelets, and immune cells, and water, nutrients, and other molecules. The trains depart from the heart, the Grand Central Station, and branch off via smaller and smaller vessels to destinations all over the body. At each destination, trains drop off their passengers at the capillaries, the smallest vessels in the body. At some destinations, passengers get off and deliver nutrients and supplies. At other locations, like the lungs, new passengers, like oxygen, hop on board. Each train returns to the heart to be pumped out to the body again. However, only 85% of the passengers riding the blood system get back on. The other 15% are picked up by the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is like a high-tech taxi system, which helps several important systems. The blood system, the immune system, and the digestive system. First, the lymphatic system returns extra fluid back to the blood system. When passengers are picked up at the lymphatic capillaries, they're called lymph. Lymph is made up of proteins, fats, immune cells, and extra fluid that has leaked out of the blood system, which needs to be returned. These capillaries merge with lymphatic vessels, which join into larger trunks and ducts, which finally drain into the heart, returning the lymph to the blood system. This is the normal journey for fluid in the body. From the blood, to the tissues, some to the lymphatics, and back to the blood. Second, the lymphatic system helps the immune system fight infection. On its journey back to the heart, lymph is stopped by many strategically placed checkpoints for the immune system, which helps your body fight infection. These are called the lymphatic organs. They include your tonsils, adenoids, Peyer's patches, hundreds of lymph nodes, and the spleen, which acts like the largest lymph node in your body. The thymus and bone marrow have important jobs as well. At these checkpoints, immune cells look for threats. If a threat is detected, the lymphatic organ calls for help 
extra lymph floods in, carrying masses of immune cells. The increased amount of lymph causes the organ to swell up. After the threat is eliminated, the swelling goes back down. Finally, the lymphatic system helps the digestive system. At the small intestine, nutrients get on the blood system. However, some nutrients, like fat, are too large to get on board and are picked up by the lymphatic system. Since this lymph is rich in fat, it's called chyle. Chyle is affected by the kind of food you eat. For example, a juicy steak makes the chyle much richer in fat and protein compared to a salad. Chyle travels up the central lymphatics, the main central highway of the lymphatic system, up to the heart, enters the bloodstream, and finally travels to the liver, where its large, rich nutrients are digested. Today you learned that the lymphatic system is one of two circulatory systems along with the blood system. It helps return extra fluid to the blood system, helps the immune system fight infection, and helps transport fat and other large molecules for your digestive system. But what happens when the lymphatic system doesn't form correctly? Click here to check out our next video on lymphatic malformations, or check the description below. All right. So, so when I when I showed that to my uh, my six year old at home, uh, one viewing and and this is the drawing that came out of it. So, so if a six year old can grasp the lymphatic system, I imagine we have a decent shot of uh, sharing it with the community. Um, I, I laugh sometimes when I watch it because the the part where the the fat molecule ha is is too big to get in the bloodstream and has to jump onto the lymphatics uh, has both of my children uh, on the floor in laughter just at the concept of it. I, you know. <laughs> Go figure. You know, another way that we've uh, really wanted to animate, and this also goes a uh, shout out to Nathan Billington, the digital animator, was kind of more of a netter quality image we wanted for some of our uh, publications. And so this is a, a preview of, of, a, of a drawing that will come out um, in a pediatric blood and cancer article very soon this year, uh, in which we wanted to depict the, the pulmonary and the intestinal lymphatics. This is normal. Um, uh, you can see uh, the thoracic duct, uh, the uh, brachiocephalic veins, the inferior vena cava, and the sternocheilae as important anatomical uh, uh, in normal lymphatics that we wanted to point out. Um, this is really exciting. I, I would give a plug that, that the, the pediatric blood and cancer is going to dedicate a, a one, um, one journal for us uh, this year that's going to be dedicated to vascular anomalies in general. Uh, Dr. Adams will have a, a section on serolimus that, that will be, it, it'll be a really great um, a, a, a version to come out uh, later this year. Um, but as we get into normal, I think it's inevitably then to also start venturing into the topics of today's, which is to get into the abnormal. Uh, and you've already had discussions that, you know, have started to discuss what simple lymphatic malformations are, macrocystic lymphatic malformations. And really the conversation today is complex lymphatic anomalies. And uh, the names you are all familiar with, uh, generalized lymphatic anomalies, Gorm Stout, uh, central conducting lymphatic anomalies and, and composed form of lymphangiomatosis. Really, you know, the, the themes, you know, with complex lymphatic anomalies that I think, you know, I wanted to convey is that that progressive dynamic nature, uh, the morbidity that is associated with these conditions. I, th I think that's the theme. But if again, you would humor me, I think that I, I wanted to kind of at least take you through the malformation video uh, as an introduction again to my thought process. I, I could explain it to you in my monologue or I could just digitalize it in, in how, we, how we made it. And so again, I, I, hopefully you guys enjoy these. Uh, so this is the second and, and, and of only two videos. So enjoy. Welcome to part two of our lymphatic system series on lymphatic malformations by the Vascular Anomaly Center at Children's Hospital, Colorado. Click here to watch part one, which explains how the lymphatic system works, or check out the description below. A lymphatic malformation is when the lymphatic system doesn't form correctly, causing parts of the body to swell. 
Since it occurs before birth, it's a congenital or primary condition and is usually visible by early childhood or more rarely later in life. It can vary greatly between people and can change appearance over time. To many, this swelling can be emotionally distressing, socially isolating, and difficult to understand. When we form in the womb, our cells read our DNA, or blueprints, to build everything in our bodies, including the blood and lymphatic systems, the two mass transit systems of our bodies. If the blueprint is misread or contains errors, the lymphatics get built incorrectly and are malformed. This is why it's called a lymphatic malformation. Terms like cystic hygroma and lymphangioma, while still widely used, are outdated and incorrect because they suggest some relation to cancer. A lymphatic malformation is not cancer and does not become cancerous. There are many kinds of lymphatic malformations. First, cystic lymphatic malformations are lymphatics that were built incorrectly. The lymph piles up like a traffic jam, forming a group of bubbles, which we call cysts. They can be microcystic, meaning tiny bubbles, macrocystic, meaning big bubbles, or mixed. The microcystic type form in clusters and are very small and sponge-like. If near the skin, they may appear as small blisters called blebs. The macrocystic type are larger than about two centimeters and can become much larger. They look like soft, smooth, translucent bubbles under the skin and may tint the skin slightly blue. They can be painful and put pressure on other parts of the body. Both types can form anywhere in the body, but most often form near major lymphatic channels, especially near the neck and armpits. CCLAs, or central conducting lymphatic anomalies, are when the central lymphatics, the main central highway that transports chyle from the intestines, is malformed much larger traffic jams form, and the body tries to relieve the pressure by building new routes anywhere it can, even taking side streets. These new routes don't reach the heart, however, and the lymph pools up again, and some pools may leak into the chest or abdomen. When this happens, fats, proteins, immune cells, and other important passengers can't get to their destinations which, over time, starts to cause health problems throughout the body. In the chest, this is called a chylothorax, which can cause a cough, discomfort in the chest, and difficulty breathing. In the abdomen, it's called chylocystitis. The abdomen can become very large, full, and painful. Lymphatic malformations may not become visible until later in life, and many things can change their appearance. For example, when an injury occurs, immune cells are sent to the affected area. If the injury gets infected, even more immune cells are sent. If a cyst is nearby, it can swell or even fill up with blood, changing its appearance. The infection itself can also cause redness, swelling, and pain. A cyst may also expand slowly with age, or more rapidly during puberty. There are many ways to treat a lymphatic malformation depending on its cause. First, the cyst may be observed over time to see if it deflates on its own. Next, sclerotherapy can help macrocystic lymphatic malformations shrink or collapse. While asleep under general anesthesia, the cyst is partially deflated. And a medication is injected that irritates it. 
causing scar tissue to form. This irritation lasts for about two to three days and usually swells for one to two weeks. Over about a month, the cyst starts to shrink as the scar tissue grows. Multiple treatments may be needed depending on the extent of the malformation. If the cyst is limited to a small enough area, part of it can be removed by surgery. This option depends on many factors, like how nearby organs would be affected by the surgery. Unless the malformation is limited to a small area, sclerotherapy and surgery will not completely repair it, and flare-ups of swelling can still happen. These symptoms can be managed, however, but need long-term monitoring. Finally, medications may help slow the flow of lymph and soften the cyst. This helps organize the traffic jams, allowing them to drain. This is an active field of research, and places like Children's Hospital Colorado are helping future medications become more targeted, personalized, and effective. Our team is ready to work with you to best understand and treat your lymphatic malformation. To learn more, contact the Vascular Anomaly Center by visiting our website below. All right. I know, I know you can almost can't contain yourself. You're thinking, did I make it in time for Oscar contention? Uh, for that video. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I feel like there's a few categories uh, we could definitely uh, be in contention for. So complex lymphatic anomalies, again, the theme here being these are high-risk lesions, dynamic, diffuse, destructive, you know, progressive. These are the words I want to use. And the two major complications to think about today is bone involvement and lymphatic leak in my mind. These are the two really morbid conditions and, and potentially life-threatening conditions associated with these disorders. Um, for bone environment in particular, uh, we want you to start thinking about that this is a spectrum of vascular anomalies that have interosseous proliferation of angiomatous structures and, and lymphatic malformations. And this is a concept that I think in series like this has been brought up by our research colleagues uh, that have demonstrated the proliferation of lymphatic and epithelial cells within the bone. You know, but but you know, one one thing that I would call out, and this is you know directly pointing a finger at me and and those in the field, is we really have lacked the standardized clinical practices regarding diagnosis and treating these conditions, and we have really fallen behind other fields as far as publishing natural history data uh, on outcomes. You know, we we have never been organized enough to actually give the general population an outcome of these disorders. What is the true morbidity, mortality of these conditions? And, and so the, the literature is, is mostly retrospective. So, you know, you and I out there, we're going to have to remedy that. We're going to have to find a way to move this field in a prospective nature. And as rare as these conditions are, it's going to take a village, you know? And so I think there's a, a call to arms here to, to do that together. Uh, very briefly, because I know there are webinars dedicated to these individuals specifically, I'll call out the, the, the anomalies to mention today. The central conducting lymphatic anomalies was, was in the video itself, really as a broad category where you have an obstruction of the central lymphatics that could lead to almost a, uh, an enlargement of that traffic jam in the lymphatic channel, a dismotility of flow, a an, a, a retrograde reflux and, and potential lymphatic leak, you know, depending on where uh, the, the, the channels are into the abdomen or the thorax, um, as mentioned in the video. Uh, and this, you know, either being a congenital uh, somatic change, somatic genetic change in the lymphatics to, to result in this, you know, malformed development, or, you know, potentially even the anatomic obstruction of that, of that central, uh, central freeway system uh, to lead to this backflow. Uh, and, and it's already been mentioned, the surgical interventional and potential pharmacotherapy options. I would say for CCLAs in particular, we have not been as successful to develop pharmacotherapy options. It has not necessarily been one where serolimus, as been mentioned before, has had uh, the most success. But, you know, I, I, would, I would point out that lymphatic leak is really one of the major complications of uh, CCLAs and some of the other complex lymphatic anomalies that we'll mention. Lymphatic leak can be incredibly catastrophic. Here, I wanted to uh, illustrate uh, lymphangiomatosis uh, as the overproliferation of lymphatic vessel, lymphagectasia as the inappropriately dilation of lymphatic vessels and the potential for uh, chylothorax or chyla societies 
uh, to accumulate uh, as one of the greater morbidities of these conditions. Uh, I think we don't put enough attention into, you know, guiding our colleagues into diagnosing lymphatic leak. Uh, here is a, a table that lists some of the features of the fluid that if you were to have in your differential that the fluid that could be collecting is lymphatic in nature, you know, how would you actually test for it? I would call to attention probably these latter two as tests that I regularly send, triglycerides and, and the lymphocyte count uh, within the fluid to get a greater sense of if, if what's being um, aspirated either from the lung or from the, flu uh, from the abdomen is actually lymphatic fluid. I think that's a huge component in your diagnostic if this is the first time you're running into a complication of an anomaly. Uh, you know, just to kind of expand upon, you know, what does it actually mean to lose lymphatic fluid, you know, and, and why do I call this such a, uh, a, a morbid condition, you know, in some ways, it's a lot of protein. We talked about how protein rich the chyle is and, and to, to lose that amount of protein is to really put the fluid in your body in, in what quote unquote third spacing that leads to a lot of edema, the extremities. Uh, there's an inevitable malnourishment that comes from not only the loss of nutrients and proteins with in the lymphatics, but the fact that there's a lot of withholding of nutrition uh, as a solution, you know, to try to prevent further lymphatic leaks. So you lose a lot of volume, you lose a lot of electrolytes. And then as a hematologist, I'm particularly sensitive to the immunodeficiency and coagulopathy. So you lose a ton of lymphocytes in that fluid and that's your immune system. That's T and B cells. That's what produces antibodies, you know, uh, and you lose a number of factors that can make you slightly more susceptible to bleeding, you know, and potentially clotting. And so I, I think that those are under-recognized complications of these lymphatic leaks that make them so dangerous. This list is quite, you know, impactful. Most kids that have this laundry list are in some form of ICU, NICU, or PICU, uh, you know, and dealing with refractory leaks that require a lot of maintenance and replacement. Um, uh, in that article I mentioned that it'll come out in, in pediatric blood and cancer, it'll be our particular approach to, to lymphatic leak. And so hopefully people enjoy an outlined algorithm, you know, of, of how we uh, address that. And potentially maybe if there's time in a future webinar, we can address lymphatic leak, you know, in its fullest details. Uh, Gorham stout is the next condition just to mention. I think many on the webinar are probably familiar with Gorham stout. This is probably the pinnacle of bone involvement uh, and, and had the previous nickname of the vanishing bone disease. Uh, things that I would highlight to point out uh, as far as, you know, this is again, the pinnacle of having infiltrated lymph lymphovascular channels within the bone and surrounding soft tissues. That is the keywords progressive with cortical involvement, you know, in its destruction without sign of adequate repair. So you have injury without the ability to keep up and repair uh, as opposed to generalized lymphatics, which we'll get to, uh, this is a little more focal, uh, in, you know, and, and kind of uh, a regional as opposed to full body in, involvement. And speaking of generalized lymphatic anomalies, uh, you know, which is a little bit of a, a broad term, one has to think we'll, we'll subcategorize this going forward. Uh, generalized lymphatic anomalies are within the uh, thought to be PIK3CA uh, related spectrum, as, as many have found somatic mutations of, in, in PIK3CA pathway. Um, this is a multifocal lymphatic anomaly, meaning, you know, in multiple bones throughout the body can be involved. It has less of that progressive destructive nature to it. It has a little more of a, a stability to it. Um, uh, but nonetheless, there can be involvement within the skin, the spleen, the intestines, the liver, the lung, you know, and so to, you know, no one individual is necessarily the same as the next as far as what morbidity each one presents with. Uh, the cortical bone in this, in this condition is spared uh, and, and adjacent soft tissue involvement is slightly less common. Uh, and of course, Kaposiform lymphangiomatosis, which I would imagine some would consider it a subset of generalized lymphatic anomaly, uh, you know, describing it as having a much more of a predilection to the intrathoracic and extra, extra thoracic effusions, you know, um, and those effusions being very uniquely hemorrhagic. So I mentioned that coagulopathy is often a potential complication. It is more the rule than not with Kaposiform lymphangiomatosis. Uh, this one certainly is deserving of the titles of aggressive proliferative refractory uh, and, and, and with the potential for bony involvement and, and lytic lesions as well. Essentially, and this is kind of my own commentary, I feel like there are features of, of CCLAs, GLAs, and, 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 and KHEs, Kaposiform hemangioendotheliomas, 
which are more lymphatic tumors or, or vascular tumors. But there are features of those that, that, that give KLA such, it's such aggressive properties, you, you know? Um, and so again, I think, you know, nomenclature is something we continue to, to strive to perfect, but I, I would consider this kind of a subcategory of GLA at this point. So let's, let's talk just for a brief moment about bone remodeling. Uh, this is just a generic picture of the concept that at, at any point in time, there is a nice balance between trying to uh, carry out bone resorption via the osteoclasts uh, and bone formation via the osteoblasts. And that's a nice equilibrium that occurs over time. Uh, uh, to reshape any micro injuries to your bone. And so you're doing that, you're doing that right now, you know, out there. Uh, and so, so what is it about these disorders that disrupts that equilibrium? Well, you know, in, in complex lymphatic anomalies as a general subject, I would say that there are these uh, conversations uh, that the research is actively, you know, happening now to discuss, you know, what component is actually resorption? What component is, 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 is this bony destruction? Uh, uh, how much would, is, is it deserved of the title of saying that this is really an infiltration or invasion of cells, you know, that uh, from the lymphatic system? Uh, you know, I would call attention to a good friend of the lymphatic network, uh, which is Michael Dillinger, the good Dr. Dillinger. Uh, I would, uh, you know, never uh, attempt to summarize his work. Uh, he says it great himself that I would look up his own work to really prove the modeling of how lymph lymphatic endothelial cells uh, can uh, infiltrate or invade into bone, uh, you know, and have an enormous proliferation of lymphatic channels when at baseline, you do not have lymphatics in your bones. So this is a, a quite abnormal process. I, I certainly have learned a lot from his mouse models to demonstrate how theoretically or, or possibly this may actually happen in, in the human body. Uh, I, I think we should all you know, support the, the research community. And, and one of the issues that I think is gonna be the call to arms is, is how do we get Dr. Dill Dillinger the samples he needs? How do we actually organize to get him the samples to complete this in a, in a, a more human model? Uh, so, so what do we, how do we go about treating these conditions? So we're talking about complex lymphatic anomalies. We're talking about bony involvement that uh, may uh, have some progressive nature like Gorham Stout or may have some static nature but cause some bony issues like a GLA. Well, you know, of course, serolimus is going to come up. I would never attempt to repeat the lecture and, and fail at it miserably that Dr. Adams can do uh, to say that that has been a product that uh, has uh, gained merit and has uh, uh, more than a, a slide's worth of retrospective case reports, you know, you know, but again, uh, what we lack in the field is the prospective nature of trying to test these out and, and continue to make that plug, you know, out there. Uh, and the potential in the future to look at how these pathways have expanded from the, you know, the, the, the dreams of Dr. Adams in, a, in, a, in an mTOR pathway to expand to just how many pathways are now involved that involve uh, beyond even lymphatics, the entire lymphatic anomaly spectrum. Uh, but the, but the, you know, the AKT mTOR uh, PIK3CA pathway has really come under the spotlight right now as being a, a target for these conditions. And so in some way, shape or form, most uh, recipes towards therapies in symptomatic complex lymphatic anomalies is going to involve serolimus. And I would say even beyond bony involvement, uh, the, the realm of lymphatic leak has taken advantage of serolimus as well as it has an ability to functionally improve the situation. You know, this is not the miracle uh, lymphatic malformation be gone. Uh, uh, this is something that can really calm the amount of lymphatic flow, calm the amount of uh, either coagulopathy or, or lymphatic leak, uh, you know, and really functionally improve the situation without potentially, uh, you know, and allowing the anomaly itself to disappear. Uh, so it is a really good tool and an adjuvant in, in the fight against um, uh, bone involvement in, in, in lymphatic uh, complex lymphatic anomalies. The other one that I would spend a, a, you know, a few slides on is bisphosphonates. Uh, and so bisphosphonates have been around a long time to treat uh, in the adult world osteoporosis, uh, very you know, kind of just dabbling into rare conditions within pediatrics, but the general concept being used to increase 
bone density. So, uh, you know, in the scale at the bottom of the screen, if you can decrease the amount of resorption, then maybe you can increase the amount of uh, at time spent on formation of bone. Uh, so he, in, in this way, bisphosphonates find their way to the bone, they concentrate within the bone, and they stimulate uh, osteoclast to, uh, apoptosis, you know, and so in general, they would then decrease the number of, of osteoclasts and in turn, uh, decrease bone resorption uh, in, in theory, you know, that's, that's, that's the concept there. And although they, they're available in, in oral form, uh, in pediatrics, we have more experience uh, using them in the IV form. I bring up zoledronic acid as it's probably the most common adjuvant used for uh, a complex lymphatic anomalies with bone involvement. This is a third generation bisphosphonates. Almost every generation has increased exponentially in the potency. So this is greater than 10,000 times more potent than first generation bisphosphonates. And uh, it, it, it's fairly well tolerated. I'll get into some of the side effects in a second. But I think it's fair to put it out there. The, the optimal length of therapy in children, you know, you know, is is unknown. Again, where is our prospective bisphosphonate study that says um, uh, that we know exactly how to use these in children? Um, they have a very long half-life. And I think that this is something to keep in mind, you know, they concentrate in the bone. And so they stick around a lot longer than when you're done using them. They still have some beneficial effect. You know, they're still within there for a long time. So 50% of the dysphosphonates remain in the bone for months or years while the rest is, is excreted. And so I would put the question out there because I'm not gonna claim to have the answer. What is the correct dose and frequency uh, to use? Uh, in, in the pediatric population with these disorders. Bisphosphonates, you know, in, in the oral form uh, have a lot of gastrointestinal side effects. I think we, we try to avoid that in the IV form, but it's well known that in the infusion of bisphosphonates kind of has a, a shake and bake flu-like reaction. You can have fevers, chills, myalgias. You have to really be careful in your monitoring of calcium levels as you know before and after your infusions as hypocalcemia is a complication. Uh, there has been reports of bone pain for zoledronic acid, uh, the IV form in particular, there have been rare reports of osteonecrosis of the jaw and transient iritis or uveitis, which is also rare. But I think going through these side effects, you start to see where collaboration at your center with an endocrinologist is going to be very fair. Uh, collaboration with a multidisciplinary team is probably the rule, you know, within these disorders. Um, could you hypothetically make the bones too dense, you know, by using too much? Could you impair bone min mineralization and growth? I think the jury is is kind of still out in, in that regard. Uh, but I pitch these out there as our, our thought provoking uh, uh, questions, you know, as we get into therapy. Uh, right now, I would say most of us believe that there is some synergistic benefit, both of using sirolimus in its mTOR mechanism and bisphosphonates as it kind of encourages uh, more bone formation uh, that, that potentially even beyond just their individual benefits that there may be some synergistic benefits, you know, uh, going forward. Um, and so I would, I would call attention that that there is some work uh, by Yasser Diab and et al. Uh, Dr. Adams was part of that. Many of you out there were probably part of that uh, to look retrospectively at the lymphatic registry that Boston had hosted and continues to host um, in their effort to look at uh, patients with uh, complex lymphatic anomalies who were treated with these dual therapies, you know, in a retrospective manner. And they, they came up with a, a really nice cohort, but obviously with a highly variable presentation of, of, of symptoms. Uh, but they were able to come up with some commonalities as far as what, what would one recommend as supportive care between uh, PJP prophylaxis, supplemental calcium and vitamin D. Uh, they were able just to see the variability out there in what one would measure for disease response. So what would be your imaging modality that you would follow uh, these bony involvements? Most of us would use MRI as one modality to capture both the soft tissue you know, uh, component. Uh, and, then, and then I think the jury is kind of out on how many use skeletal surveys versus DEXA scans. I think this is really where uh, the efforts to, to uh, involve our orthopedic and our endocrine colleagues is going to make a big difference in trying to settle on how the field can come together to create some standards of practices. They did, you know, prove it you know, to some sense that, that it is a safe 
therapy that uh, as far as effective, you know, they, they had some that improved and many that stabilized. And I think that's a win. I think many of us out there, you would agree, stability is a win, especially in Gorham Stout, which is the definition of a progressive disease. Uh, so stability can be quite the win in a scenario where you're dealing with lymphatic leak and can't get chest tubes out. You know, this is the stability is a win when you are uh, functionally having problems because of the anatomic disappearing bone component of it. So, uh, you know, a lot was uncovered and even a retrospective component here. And I applaud uh, Yasser Diab, uh, Dr. Adams, and, and the rest of that consortium that came together, uh, who presented their work in ISFA, and I think is either in abstract, uh, in manuscript form or, or soon to be in manuscript form, but kudos to them for taking that on, uh, and for even starting with the registry, that's phenomenal that they were able to do that. I want to call attention to, you know, a, a current effort that, that, that I'm uh, trying to uh, put out there. Uh, and, and I put it out there welcoming the feedback. I think it's welcome the feedback because this is the community and we have to do this together. You know, um, we have to create some form of natural history study that allows us to collect the data going forward. You know, prospective to me is the big brooch that we need to attempt to do as a community. So the lullaby study is a pitch that we're trying to create amongst the Canvas Consortium, the consortium of like-minded uh, pediatric hematologists, oncologists uh, throughout the, the country uh, led by Dr. Adams. Um, and so this is uh, titled The Longitudinal Understanding of Lymphatic Anomalies with Bone Involvement. As far as an outline, uh, you know, as far as people that are involved, I, hopefully we got a lot of the main players that I've mentioned who've done great work. Some of the great researchers out there for the field, Dr. Dillinger, Dr. Tim uh, LaCroix, uh, some of the great uh, other uh, endocrinologists that, that have collaborated with back centers across the country. Uh, uh, and you'll even notice uh, the attempt to involve patient advocates, parent advocates, uh, and, and groups uh, like the LDGA out there. Uh, so what, it, what is it that we would be trying to accomplish? And again, this isn't necessarily open, it's still a work in progress, but I thought if I have the opportunity to speak to the community, you might as, know, might as well know what we are trying to accomplish. We would love a prospective multi-center natural history study that, that looks at the response rate of lymphatic anomalies, both to what physicians are doing now, which is just mostly supported care, uh, in, in an observational arm, just get kids and see what the natural history is. And in addition to a, a pitch standard of care dual pharmacotherapy with sirolimus and zoledronic acid. And this would be not necessarily an interventional trial. This is a natural history study. This is pitching that if this is the standard of care practice now, can we take advantage of a prospective observational study to know what the outcome is of a standardized regimen? Uh, and of course, this is gonna be difficult to standardize. It's going to be difficult to assume that all providers will be comfortable with the same uh, guided dose and guided monitoring. But I think that's the bold challenge we're taking is to see, can we move to a prospective way and to unite you know, the field in a, in a, a like-minded thought process. The only way we'll learn to adapt our regimens if we start with a regimen and then kind of go forward from there. So, you know, aim 1A is, is feasibility. We have to see if it's possible to, you know, to do this. Uh, aim 2B, I mean, aim 1B is really, you know, what are the measures going to be? What are the outcome measures that we would use? And so I think this is truly a field where you have to use patient reported outcome measures, you know, in, in the sense, patient reported pain patient reported quality of life and functionality using potentially the promise measures, which is a very common public tool that the NIH has produced to create a common language to a patient related outcome measures. Uh, I would encourage kind of looking up that tool uh, as I think you will, you know, we've seen it more and more pan subspecialty. Uh, you know, in this way, we will start to identify and uh, peripheral blood markers of disease and follow them and radiographic documentation of disease as measurements of outcome. Uh, we, you know, recruiting the uh, basic science uh, translational collaboratives that we, that we have, I think is to have the opportunity, why would we not in a prospective study, the ability to add a biology study that would collect uh, samples in a prospective manner at time points of therapy that we were really interested in to monitor 
you know, the biomarkers of disease, uh, you know, and in addition, you know, actually bank a, a sample of everyone's tissue if available and blood if available. We, you know, you know, I think, you know, the researchers have had to kind of pick and juice from retrospective samples, but if we gave them the ability to collect samples in the way that they uh, would like to in an order, you know, that they'd like to, then we've kind of organized, uh, you know, a thought process for them and organized a question for them. Uh, some of the markers that I'll just mention that we've uh, thought about there that are, you know, currently in practice and hypothetically in practice are all markers of bone turnover. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I won't go through, I'm looking at, I got my eye on the clock. I, I won't go through every single one of these, but to say that, 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 um, you know, markers of bone resorption, uh, markers of bone formation have kind of been the mainstay, uh, theoretical biomarkers to use for these conditions in response to therapy. How well are we protecting bone? Uh, are we slowing the rate of resorption? Are we increasing the rate of formation over time? Uh, and then I would uh, additionally point to the research that, that I've always already pointed out, uh, the work that's been done by our, our colleagues to, to highlight that the angiopoietin markers may be a, a marker of, of response and um, I think Dr. Adams also pointed out some references in her previous webinar of, of a case report of KLA in which this was followed um, very um, astutely, you know, over time. And so hopefully we can expand that to a larger population. We need power, basically. Um, the inclusion is going to be very broad, you know, it, it is going to be, you know, for the observation of component, it's almost going to be all comers and in any state of uh, uh, function, you know, as they are, uh, there'll be a little more strict criteria for the pharmacotherapy arm, you know, really being in the uh, eyes of the provider that's seeing them that they have active disease that requires uh, this form of intervention. And if so, making sure that that a provider is comfortable with the standard of care arm, because these are not meds that will be provided by pharma. This is not that type of interventional. Again, the, the, the key word is natural history. So, you know, I would, I would kind of start to sum things up a little bit to say that, you know, you can, you can see how multidisciplinary this field is. Uh, you know, all of us recognize that it, that it takes a village, not just amongst ourselves that are interested, but of the subspecialties. And really just honored and proud to be a part of this community and, and thanking you guys for having me on uh, at the Vas Vascar Anomaly Center in, in, in Colorado. You know, we've tried to, you know, uh, build this mantra uh, and, and I'm very grateful to the mentorship I've had out there. Uh, you know, uh, many of the, uh, the, the, the researchers and, and physicians I've mentioned in this conference have taken it their time to help me build the center we have. Uh, and so uh, just, just really thrilled to, to, to be, be a part of the community. Uh, I, I, I'll leave with one note and then I'll open the chat box to, to, to see, oh, the Q&A box. If you have questions, go to the Q&A box. Um, but in this world of Zoom, I, I thought I'd leave you with kind of this, this favorite children's story of all of us. Uh, good night, moon. Good night, Zoom. Good night, sense of impending doom. I kind of feel like it is, you know? I mean, obviously the, the world is, didn't change overnight when we turned to 2021, but, you know, I had a... Um, a patient contacted me yesterday that that I that I had sent to the NIH for an evaluation, and she said it was so busy because the the president is visiting, um, and it just kind of made you reflect on the fact that you know uh, you know we have the momentum now uh, that there can be a greater focus on science and 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 there can be a greater focus that we're you know, you know, that the president is at the, the NIH today, today, actually. Uh, and, and I really think that, you know, this community can help advocate for rare disease. It's a great month to do that. Uh, and, and that, you know, hopefully together, uh, we, we can build some momentum in 2021 uh, for complex lymphatic anomalies. Uh, this is just always a thank to my own uh, colleagues at my center uh, thank you so much to, to, to the Lymphagic Education Network. It really uh, is fun to be a part of this community and hopefully I do some justice to, to being part of this community. Uh, and with that, I'm going to see if I can open the Q&A. Give me one second. Yeah, I think there's a, a theme to a couple questions out there that are questioning you know, the baseline understanding of, of do we have lymphatics in bone? Um, and you know, the answer is, is that, you know, in all likelihood, you know, they, they are likely involved in some of the network and, and they're, 
the literature that probably supports that the most is actually the theories within cancer metastasis uh, and, and the, the theories of how lymphatics can play a role in the spread of, uh, of, of cancer molecules and lymphatics and, and, and bone disease in that respect. Uh, so there must be a mechanism in which they you know, can circulate you know, similarly in the area. Um, I think the jury is still out and, and I would hesitate to say you know, the, the, the mechanism of, of why such an abnormal presence of lymphatics within the bone, you know, occurs. I, I again, I think Dr. Dillinger came the closest to educating me on a, in, you know, on the possible mechanism of how uh, the lymphatic endothelial cells can actually, you know, have a presence. But truly, this is, you know, you know, this is a quite abnormal presence of lymphatics. Uh, the type of structures, the type of channels, the type of presence that's being built is, is quite a normal, abnormal in these disorders and 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 destructive. Do we know that the mechanism is osteolysis? You know, I think that's a question mark out there. Um, you, you know, but I, but I do think that the work he's doing is, um, uh, you know, is leading towards answers in the area. So, I, I think this is one that that I would put out there that that I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, you know, personally, the mechanism, uh, you know, of, of the the destruction. Um, and, 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 but, and I do believe that the bones likely have some relationship to the lymphatics at baseline, uh, but certainly not in, a, uh, in an, active, an active channel of lymphatics through the bone. You know. um, how long do we use serolimus? So, so uh, you know, there's, there's a couple questions here uh, addressing the pharmacotherapy of these agents. And there's, you know, again, I, I won't get too much into overlap in what uh, Dr. Adams does, but we do have a, um, a, you know, kind of a central mantra, you know, that we can share in, in, in the conversation of, of serolimus. First and foremost is feeling like uh, you have the, you know, the safety network and experience within your institution uh, to, 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 to wield serolimus, meaning uh, that these will be, you will use uh, potentially a, pneumo, a, a, a PCP prophylaxis in this scenario, uh, that you have uh, an experienced relationship with either hematology oncology, you know, to wield it so that there's monitoring, uh, uh, you know, blood monitoring of levels, levels of a uh, kidney, uh, liver and, and triglyceride uh, function over time. Really the first disclaimer is, you know, are, you, are we in a position to use it? If, if using it, then uh, the second thing is kind of, you know, what are you aiming for as far as dose? You know, there's kind of two mindsets of kind of low dose and high dose uh, of what you're trying to accomplish and what level kind of trough level are you are you keeping at? Are you keeping it at this more at a, a five to eight trough level or or in kind of an eight to fifteen high dose, you know, and in, in what you're trying to induce there. And and again, monitoring that that this is an agent that uh, isn't immunocompromising, you know, making sure that it isn't immunocompromising when you get to those high doses, watching your neutrophil count, watching side effects like uh, ulcerations uh, around the mouth, oral ulcers. I think that's really important. So, so do, you know, I would, the preface to that, I know it's a little bit of a monologue is to make sure you're ready to do it, that you have a mindset of, of what you're dosing. I, I think that most of us that started uh, give a, a conversation to the families that this isn't the fastest medicine in the world, that if you start it, one, it could take two to four weeks to reach an equilibrium as a level, and two, you may wanna sign up for three to six months to really have a feeling that you can make a difference at all. So, so honestly, it may take three to six months to know if you've made a difference uh, at all. And then it's also, what is it that you're making a difference of? Is your goal functional? Is your goal uh, pain and discomfort? Is it coagulopathy? Uh, those are really good things to kind of have written down in the beginning. What is your actual goal for improvement? And if it's bone, certainly it's not overnight. You, you know, if, it, if it's truly to stop bony progression of, 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 of bone loss, uh, then, then it's slow and steady that wins the race. Most of us, you know, that are using it in a situation where we're going after bone are imaging kind of on an annual basis, understanding that we can probably give this um, medication safely for, for a, a, you know, something measured in months to years as a, you know, you know, something, you know, and so, so, so as far as how long do we use the, you know, the serolimus, I would say that most of us when we're going after bone are talking about to families that will be on this for one to two years, uh, knowing that we're going to use imaging and functional outcomes 
uh, lymphatic leak, et cetera, as our outcomes you know, to do this? Are we trying to use this to get off a, a chest tube you know, for lymphatic leak? Are we trying to use this to um, uh, stop the progression of bone loss? Really important when you use sirolimus to know what your goals of therapy are. You have to have some measure uh, of, of if you're making progress you know, in, in that way. Let me see what else we got in here. Uh, there, there's a couple questions in here about uh, the influence of mRNA vaccination, I, I, you know, and, and the possibility that could impact uh, anomalies of the lymphatic system. And it's very timely. Obviously, everyone's excited uh, at, at the advent of, of wide distribution of the vaccines. I don't have an answer to that, but to say that we are very much in the field trying to actively uh, follow in database form active patients with vascular anomalies in COVID, uh, you know, and so we were we would we were going to try to trend uh, going forward questions that include vaccination within that. Uh, so I would say uh, I don't have the answer, but at least again in a spirit of collaboration, uh, if people could feed into, if providers could feed into that registry, uh, we could start collecting the impact of COVID uh, on the vascular anomaly population, and then we could additionally. Um, uh, you know, introduce questions about vaccinations as that goes forward. And I don't have it readily available, uh, but you know, if, if people were interested in access to where they could submit cases of vascular anomaly, you know, uh, that have COVID, uh, we, we, I, could, I could certainly share that with the Lymphatic Education and Research Network that we could get out there uh, because we're all kind of going into this together. Um, um, Sclerotherapy bone lesion seen in patients with bone involvement in the are scler sclerotic bone lesions seen in patients with bone involvement? So, so I, I you know, the, the, there's a question on um, if we see sclerotic bone lesions in patients with bone involvement and lymphatic malformations. Um, I don't know if I 100% understand the, the question, um, but, um, but certainly, you know, this is the, 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 the diffuse involvement of bone or the diffuse involvement of the, the anomaly certainly um, in my mind is where you transition from simple lymphatic malformations, which don't typically involve bony structures um, uh, and to these complex lymphatic anomalies. So, you know, adding the word complex may be, you know, nuanced or, or, or nomenclature and, and have different meanings. But for me, it's high risk, you know, it, it's really adding high risk. I, I think to me, that's the difference there. Uh, could you comment on the importance of vaccination in the vascular anomaly and lymphatic disease community? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that, you know, this is, you know, even outside of the, the, the COVID uh, vaccine questions, uh, it comes up a lot as far as um, just general concept of vaccination in this community. And, you know, we, we, we use these products like Serolimus knowing that on the surface, you know, they are, they are immunosuppressants, you know, that are out there. Um, but if we wield them appropriately, our goal is not to immunocompromise individual. If we wield and we monitor them appropriately, uh, our goal is to not immunocompromise individuals out there. Um, but I, but I would say that that we are most of us are, are pretty keen on making sure that uh, children are are quite protected and up to date with their regular vaccinations uh, going into therapy, as it is difficult to. Uh, specifically for live vaccines, uh, give vaccinations while on serolimus. I think that uh, the, the jury is still out there because m some of us in the field believe that uh, you should be off of these medications when giving vaccinations. Some of them believe that it, it's safe while on. Well, prospective studies will answer that question. But until then, you know, I, I think we do make a pitch that it's important. We know lymphatics, you know, in general is quite responsive to uh, inflammatory and infectious stimuli. I mean, and, and, and so I think that, you know, most of us uh, have patients that exacerbate more significantly with the common cold, uh, you know, their anomalies and, and their health than the kids standing next to them. And so making sure that they are immune protected uh, is very important. So, so I think that it is quite important to the community to know that at baseline, your pediatric, uh, you know, vascular anomalists are, are quite supportive of, of the baseline vaccines. The nuances of using the a vaccinating during and, and in between therapies, I think I won't, you know, make a blanket statement on and, and defer to the individual provider you have, but say that it is on our shoulders as a community to, to address that field. 
really appreciate the time hanging out with you guys, uh, you know, out there. It, it's, it's, we don't always get a lot of face-to-face -face stuff. So hopefully it's, it's fun to, that we'll get to uh, build this community as we can online and then and have a, a shindig at some point. I saw that there's uh, some events that, that have been uh, um, uh, advocated for there. And so, um, you know, stay part of the community uh, and we'll kind of go forward with this together. Thanks everyone, appreciate it.